in a sense, we come to the heart of, uh, I was going to say the heart of the gospel, but at least the heart of the atonement, <laughs> what we mean when we talk about the atoning work of Christ. And so, to me, this is an important area. Uh, there are a few problems in it, or at least questions, uh, some disagreements, but uh, it's a very important area. And I think it relates also to the paper that you are doing uh, shortly. But we need to uh, just touch briefly here. We, we're talking about the death of Christ and what it was. And I think we left off talking about it in the sense of, uh, on your page 34, did he suffer spiritual death? And we talked about whether he took the second death. And uh, I think that we have to say he did. That in some sense, uh, he experienced a spiritual separation from the Father. Uh, as the person of the God-man. I want to just comment here that uh, in, in a sense then you could say that Christ experienced spiritual death even as we do. The difference is that our spiritual death is uh, self-initiated. In other words, we willfully turn away from God. Uh, the only reason Jesus suffered a spiritual death is because he had taken on our sins and therefore was abandoned by God. So the cause of it, well, I guess you could say the cause of it is sin, uh, but how that works out, we are responsible for separating uh, willfully. And of course, Christ uh, did not ever sin he simply took our sins on, but as a result, he was separated in the same sense of a spiritual death that we have. Okay, now what is the nature of that? Let me just suggest a few things it can't be. Uh, we can't understand that spiritual death as a separation of the two persons of the Godhead. It just seems to me that it's impossible to conceive of the Trinity uh, sort of breaking up that there was always a trinity, and therefore there was always a relationship between the Father and the Son. And I guess as we've talked about earlier, if we do think of Jesus as fundamentally functioning in two roles, an incarnate role and a discarnate role, if that's legitimate, then I would say he experienced the separation in his incarnate role, but not in his uh, discarnate role, not simply as God uh, in, the, in the Trinity. And then secondly, you cannot think of it as some kind of a separation within the person, as if he just the human nature experienced it, uh, the person experienced it. So it can't be a separation of uh, body from spirit and so forth. In the final analysis, it has to be a separation of spirit to God to have spiritual death. So what it was, uh, I think the best thing that I know what to say is fundamentally that the Son of God, the Logos, the God-man, experiences death through his human nature. It, it's analogous to all of the other things that he experiences that are truly human. He experiences them through his human nature. Okay, any questions on that? That's uh, not easy always to understand, I don't think. Uh, then the question, did he suffer physical death? Well, obviously he did. That, that, much is quite clear in the Bible when he says, Father, into thy hands I commit my spirit. And when that takes place, his body is dead. So there is a separation. And the question is, how is this related to his spiritual death? See, for us, we tend to think of uh, spiritual death first, don't we? Uh, 
Well, in fact, that's the way it happened there. Or we, we, in some sense, we think of physical death first and then hell. And if we say Jesus took hell, which I think he did, the, the essence of absolute separation from God. Uh, by the way, hell cannot be absolute separation because everything exists somehow upheld by the power of God, right? So that one can't say even people in hell are absolutely separated from God. I think if they were, they would, they would be totally, uh, certainly totally dead and uh, no animation at all. But in the case of uh, Jesus, we go back to the logic of it. In the garden, they died spiritually before they died physically, right? Physical death is a result of spiritual death. And so in Jesus, see, we sort of have, that's why it's called a kind of a, well, I don't know if that's the reason it's the second death, but the Bible says that sinners outside of Christ are spiritually dead even while they live. And then they go to another death called the second death. For Jesus, the physical death and the spiritual death, uh, each one of them, they were, they weren't, there weren't sequences in the spiritual death. Spiritual death, physical death with Christ. Uh, there's no question in your mind that he died, right? Okay, now we come to the meaning of the death of Christ. And this is what I was talking about, coming to the heart of the atonement. What does the death of Christ, uh, what does it really mean? Basically, what did it really accomplish is the question before us, I think. Now, there are views of the atonement, which we will come to after we go through what we think is the biblical teaching of it. There are views of the atonement that simply see the death of Christ as having a moral influence, the so-called moral influence theory. And the question is, is there any truth at all to the moral influence theory? The moral influence theory, and I don't want to get ahead because you've studied those, is basically the death of Christ is simply designed uh, to uh, show us God's love and, and persuade us on the basis of that to repent and come to him. And that's fundamentally all the death of Christ does, is designed to have a moral influence on us. Now, is there any moral influence? I'm curious, how many of you came to Christ because you believe God loved you? Basically, on the basis of God's love. <laughs> okay, <laughs> sort of hesitantly, <laughs> not too firm on that. How many of you came to Christ to basically uh, escape hell, punishment? Okay. <laughs> now, how about the rest of you? Have you, have you ever thought about why you really, your, your parents told you, right, and you did it? I think those are probably the two ultimate motivations that you come to Christ because it's a, it's a, it seems to be such an offer of love. Uh, probably a lot of people come because of the, uh, the consequences if you don't. Uh, which is the higher motivation? Well, I mean, the reason I'm saying that is because in some sense, we live our lives based on one of those two motivations. Do we try to avoid sin because of the punishment? Uh, because God might, and it, now we're not talking about hell, but we're talking about some serious discipline, perhaps, like at the Lord's Supper, uh, because they took it in an unruly manner. Some of you are sick and some of you sleep, which means they even died as a result. So that's one way to live life, to simply live it on a kind of a legalistic way. If I sin, I'm going to get punished. The other way to live life is to realize how much God loved you and to realize that sin hurts the one, you, the one who loves you. 
to me, I think that's the higher motive, uh, to live out of a love motive. God loves us. We love him because he first loved us. Okay, but at any rate, I think that this, uh, you know, this divine or the moral influence theory has some benefit in the sense that it, does, it is the love of God, I think, that moves us to receive Christ. But what I simply want to mention here, if you look at those verses, every one of them seems to have in the context the fact that his love <coughs> entails some kind of saving action. Like in John 3.16, the love of God saves us from judgment. In other words, there, there's a judgment coming and something needs to be done about that. I think more is needed than simply repentance. Romans 5.8, the love of God goes out to sinners in order to save them from God's wrath. So something needs to be done beyond simply, in other words, there's an action of love, not just a, uh, a influence or a attitude of love. 1 John 4, 9 and 10, the love of God, he loved us and he sent his son to be the propitiation, the satisfaction for our sins. Okay, another uh, kind of theory of the atonement is that uh, it is an example. What Christ did in obedience to God is an example of what we need to do to be saved. Is Christ's death an example for us? It is an example, but for whom is it an example? It's an example for the people that are saved. You, we are to follow the example of Christ. It is never given as an example for a means to be saved. If you obey God, you will be saved in terms of works. So I would say, yes, it is an example for us to follow, but it's not an example. It's not a means of our salvation. It is rather for us who are saved. So all of those I simply put as subjective effects, meaning they simply have an effect in us. They really don't do anything outside of us. And now we're going to turn to the objective work of salvation, where God does something for us in Christ, and he offers that something, that gift, that action for our salvation. And I think it's found predominantly in three concepts. And here's where it, it seems to me that it uh, covers a great deal of what I think should be in your paper. It is described as a propitiation. It is described as a reconciliation. And it is described as a redemption. And I think these three things actually relate to the primary effects of sin. In other words, guilt is dealt with by propitiation, which we will see is basically a satisfaction toward the wrath of God. Alienation, obviously the one that would solve that one is reconciliation. And then enslavement is solved by redemption. And we'll look now at those three, beginning with propitiation. Uh, let me just read Romans 3, 25 and 26. Uh, well, I'll pick up verse 23. For all have sinned and fall short of the glory of God, being justified as a gift by his grace through the redemption which is in Christ Jesus, whom God displayed publicly as a propitiation in his blood through faith. This was to demonstrate his righteousness, because in the forbearance of God he passed over the sins previously committed. For the demonstration, I say, of his righteousness at the present time, that he might be just and the justifier of the one who has faith in Jesus. So you have that word, God displayed Christ publicly as a propitiation. Uh, some people take that to be uh, a pro propitiatory sacrifice. That's what it says in my margin. I think some people have taken that as the mercy seat. But that's the place where the blood was uh, placed and it provided a, a propitiation, propitiatory sacrifice. 
Now the basic meaning of the Greek word, which is heloskomai, and the Hebrew word, kifr, uh, which stands behind the Greek word in the Septuagint, is to appease or to avert wrath by means of an appropriate transaction or sacrifice. Do you, uh, what does the word appease convey to you? Is that a positive thing to you? See, most people think of appease as something, well, you're too young to think of this Second World War, but Neville Chamberlain appeased Hitler all the time and it didn't work. You see, you always try to give him something what he wanted, thinking that would stop him. And that's the thought, I think, that most people... So, theology generally doesn't use the word appease. It tends to use the word satisfy, a satisfaction. But the point is, it's to appease or avert wrath by means of an appropriate sacrifice. In relation to salvation, propitiation signifies the satisfaction of divine wrath against sin and thus the averting of God's punishment by means of an appropriate offering or ransom. That raises the kind of difficult question, at least some people think so, uh, of the question of the wrath of God. Does God have wrath? And uh, we simply note here, first of all, the prominence of wrath in the Old Testament. Uh, there are two, 20 words used in the Old Testament to express God's wrath, and a total of 500 occurrences. Uh, the mention of wrath in the New Testament is less frequent, but just as real. Uh, for example, Romans 1.18 talks about the wrath of God being revealed. I think John 3.36 talks about being saved from the wrath of God. But in other places, the concept is there without the term. Matthew 5.22 talks about hell fire, and 18.8 speaks of eternal fire. So uh, that, I think, suggests the wrath of God. Now, what does the wrath of God mean? Some, and I think it's still true with many, some of them feel that uh, God was a God of wrath in the Old Testament, but in the New Testament, you don't find him as a God of wrath. Have you ever heard that? That God is a, wrath, a wrathful God in the Old Testament? And you can see how they can get that. Leon Morris says it over 500 occurrences. But in the New Testament, they feel somehow that Jesus presents God as a God of love. And C.H. Dodd is one that is, makes the wrath the term. The term is in the New Testament. There's no question about it. But he wants to, to make the term not main uh, some kind of personal emotion. It's more simply the natural consequences of sin. So that, yes, people suffer wrath, but they just suffer the natural consequences. God doesn't have any animosity toward them or any. Now, in the Old Testament, it talks about, you know, it's depicted somehow as, as almost hot breath coming out of the nostrils to express God's wrath against man. And uh, Dodd says that's all gone. So, you will, well, here's what he says. Uh, it is used not to describe the attitude of God to man, but to describe an inevitable process of cause and effect in a moral universe. And that's why in some versions, for example, the old RSV, and I'm not sure what the new RSV does, but instead of propitiate, they have uh, expiate. And expiation has the idea of, well, making a payment to cancel the sin. It's just a, an objective satisfying of the sin. Propitiation has more the idea of satisfying the, the the wrath, the person, his anger toward you. And so he chooses to uh, translate, and so did the RSV, to tell you the effect that he had. He chooses to uh, eliminate the idea of any personal wrath in that word. Uh, a few thoughts here from Derek Tinball's book, The Message of the Cross. I think I put that in your bibliography. Let me just read you some of the stuff he says, which relates to this. People 
don't want to really have an angry God against us. Uh, here's what he says. More recently, a number of evangelical scholars, and this is 2001, have sought to revise the concept of God's anger. Their concern is not so much with the concept of anger itself or even with its personal character, both of which they affirm but with the retributive nature of the anger we attribute to God. So they, I guess they don't mind the anger, but when it comes to the fact that it's, it's anger as retribution for sin, they don't like. Stephen Travis, who I believe is a uh, Christian philosopher at Claremont, isn't he? Anyway, he says this, in Paul's understanding of divine judgment, ideas of punishment or retribution lie on the periphery of his thought. He thinks not so much of God imposing a retributive penalty for human sins, but of people experiencing the God-given consequences of their choices and actions. He understands both salvation and condemnation primarily in relational terms. People's destiny will be a confirmation and intestine intensification of the relationship with God or alienation from him, which has been their experience in this life. As I was reading this, I never thought of that before. I'm not sure what that adds to say that he understands uh, primarily in relational terms. That's kind of where you get a lot of anger <laughs> in relations, isn't it? So how that solves that problem. But anyway, he questions the penal view. See, that's the point. Penal substitutionary atonement is uh, under attack somewhat even by evangelicals. He questions the penal view of atonement and proposes a covenant perspective instead. God's wrath then becomes real and personal, but not retributive. Since there cannot be genuine retribution in the context of personal relationship. That's a quote from him. There cannot be genuine retribution in the context of personal relationship. Is that true? There cannot be genuine retribution in the context of personal relationship. I think when you dislike bordering to hate, another person that you know, you desire some retribution, don't you? Anyway, his wrath, that is God's wrath, consists in the intrinsic consequences of sin. So it is unnecessary to view Christ's death as propitiating an angry God. Instead, it becomes the supreme demonstration of God's commitment to bring human beings into relationship with himself. And part of that is a quote from uh, Travis. While he wants to hold firmly to the absolute seriousness of his sin and to the fact that Christ experienced divine judgment on the cross on our behalf, to speak in terms of punishment or retributive penalty is, Travis claims, quote, to go further than Paul himself goes, end quote. The supreme punishment is, he believes, the withdrawal of God's presence from the people. The concept of retribution is inadequate because it means the external imposition of punishment, whereas this covenant view of punishment emphasizes its intrinsic and relational nature. I just don't quite understand uh, where there's a great uh, difference between that. At any rate, and I don't think I will go any more, the question is, does God does God have emotional wrath uh, against sin? And my view is, as I think I've given you in the syllabus, is if we think that there's any emotional dimension in his love, he loves righteousness. If you love something and somebody destroys that, somebody hurts that, to say you don't have a negative emotion, which is perhaps best described as hatred of what's going on, uh, if hatred is the opposite of love in a sense, it seems to me, I don't see how you can have an emotional love without emotional hate. Uh, in other words, I think uh, 
if God loves righteousness and if we love righteousness, there is a sense in which we should hate the opposite. We should hate that which destroys righteousness. Yeah. Well, we, we note here, and I'm not sure that's what you're talking about, it, but one place in the syllabus it says God's wrath must not be thought of as an uncontrollable outburst of passion, but rather as a reverse side of a holy love. Uh, obviously, that's one difference. We just kind of explode, uh, sometimes irrationally, and without uh, full basis for what we do. So that would be a difference. But as far as uh, the difference between the emotion itself, what difference would you want to make? How you mean internally in himself, not how it's expressed externally to others? Yeah. How what is how does uh, Well, what is the emotion of does, what is the emotion of love? How does that affect you internally? If you say that you feel love, it's a good positive sense of well-being, isn't it? It's a uplifting thing, isn't that true? Now, when you feel hatred. Describe that feeling. Is it that same feeling of well-being? No, it's a feeling that there's a disturbance of the shalom, if I could put it that way. Now the question is, does God sense a disturbance? I guess the question first is, does he sense a shalom? <laughs> See, if it, if it has no effect on him, then I don't know what it really means, except you would say his actions are different, but they don't come. But it really would, you wouldn't, think, you wouldn't sense then that God has any, God's love to you then just means he does good things, that he has no feeling. Of love. Why, why would one want to say that? On based on the uh, kind of impassibility of God. Yes. So you're suggesting that we just take it, it's kind of an anthropological uh, thing that we apply to God. Yes, I think sometimes it becomes hard uh, when we start when we're looking at ourselves and our nature. And when we act out of anger, a lot of times it's, it's hard for us in certain circumstances not to act out of sin. And so I guess sometimes, I guess as a new believer, and I picture God, I would never want to think that he in some way would well, well, it, did Jesus have emotions? We talked about that the other day. Obviously, he did. Did he ever have irrational emotions? Would you say he ever did? If Jesus, as, as a human, could have, did he have emotions? Well, he had emotions as a human. And, and you know, you'd have to say that he, his emotions as a human were like ours. So it's possible to have emotions without irrationality. Now, if that's true, then why won't we let God have them?
Are you going to have emotions in eternity when you will hopefully not sin? Well, I know you won't sin. <laughs> so uh, I don't think that there's any reason to think we won't have emotions. Do angels have emotions? See, sometimes we connect, and emotions are felt in our physical being. Uh, when you don't have a body, can you still have emotions? Well, do angels have emotions? Do the saints in heaven in the New Jerusalem have emotions today? I think so. I don't know, class. I mean, I see no reason why uh, we cannot allow God to, uh, in other words, it bothers, well, I better be careful here. I'm going to say it bothers me sometimes that w the same word is used for God as for us, and we define it almost totally different. <laughs> See, for us, love usually entails a uh, an emotion. It's, it's just very difficult to think of love without any emotion. And to use that same word for God, extremely. We love because he first loved us and give those words totally different meanings. Seems to me kind of strange. Not totally. Both of them would be theoretically we do something good toward the other. But I mean, I'm just curious. I don't know of any real objection. I know, I think it was usually that God is an immutable. But I don't think that that means that uh, he never could change from love to non-love at a point. He remains immutably holy. And it seems to me when he runs into uh, effect of something very unholy, it affects him because he is immutable and he cannot uh, change his attitude toward it. Yes? His wrath is what? Is actually somehow fueled by his love? Yes, yeah. I think so. That was going to say, if you really love this, you really love this, then that same love for this necessitates hate for that which destroys this, or is actually the opposite. So it is an expression of love in, in some ways. I guess, though, we can't make love mean everything. <laughs> so, but I think it is related to that. Okay, uh, any other thoughts on that? To quote Leon Morris here, he says, the deepest thinkers among mankind have always thought that real forgiveness is possible only when due regard is paid to the moral law. And then he lists a bunch of significant people, writers and philosophers. He says, uh, he comes to the conclusion, it is an axiom, axiom in life and religious thought that there is no reconciliation without satisfaction. Uh, Morris adds, should we not see this as something God has implanted deep down in the human heart? Faced with a revolting crime, even the most careless among us are apt to say that deserves to be punished. And uh, our system of justice, which I think to some extent reflects what God has put in us and in the Bible uh, certainly functions that way, or at least it used to. Okay, 3E, the New Testament references to propitiation. And what I really wanted you to note is in the context of this, there seems to be at least maybe, maybe the last one doesn't have that, but certainly in the first one, there are, let's see, one, two, three, four, five mentions of wrath before Romans 3, where it speaks of God setting forth Christ as a propitiation. So clearly, propitiation is related, I think, to the problem of wrath against sin. And then in Hebrews 2.17, it speaks of us needing a merciful high priest. And some have drawn from that, that if we need mercy, we must be in big trouble, must be under hostility from God. And therefore, propitiation uh, satisfies that. And 1 John 2.2, 2, we need an advocate. We are, in essence, in a law court. And judgment is coming against us, which would be condemnation. But Jesus stands up as our propitiation. 1 John 4.10, there it simply describes this as an act of love. It, it really doesn't say anything in the context about that. 
you know, herein is love, not that we love God, but that he sent his son to be a propitiation for us. Okay, so propitiation really is the satisfaction of God's wrath against sin. Now, reconciliation, uh, the basic meaning of the verb is to change, to exchange, and then the secondary meaning of reconcile. And you can see, to be reconciled, there has to be change. In other words, if two people are angry against each other, they have something against each other, something has to change in probably both of them if they're really going to be reconciled. So that's where we get the idea of reconcile from this word change. And then we simply mention the uh, compound apa katalaso, which is, I might, you might put these references there. I wrote them in mine. Ephesians, maybe I put them in there. Ephesians 2.16 and Colossians 1, 20 and 21 have this compound word. And as Moulton and Howard say, to effect a thorough change back, reconcile. So coming to definitions, uh, Kramer says, reconciliation is the work of God in the atonement which establishes that relationship of peace with mankind which the demands of his justice had hitherto prevented. And the definition that I would suggest here is that reconciliation is the work of God in bringing back sinful man into fellowship with himself through the removal of that which caused alienation. And obviously that's talking about sin. Sin is the problem. You've got to deal with sin in order to bring reconciliation. Now the question which has been debated at this point is, what is the object of reconciliation? If you look in the Bible, all of the verses that talk about reconciliation, like 2 Corinthians 5, God was in Christ reconciling the world to himself or other places where God reconciled us. The only stated object of reconciliation in those verses is something in the creation. I mean, us, the world, those of it. Never, the Bible never speaks of God being reconciled to us. And on the basis of that, people like F.F. F. Bruce there and Chafer and his systematic theology uh, would argue that reconciliation is accomplished by changing man, by somehow uh, making a change in man so that now he is favorable to God. On the other hand, there are those that see the object as God, that God is reconciled. And for some of them, like Shed, this comes very close to the equivalent of propitiation. In other words, God's wrath, that is what has changed. And now God can, uh, can love us and have relationship with us because that wrath is, is averted. So for him, it's very close to propitiation. But some of the others have it as well, that, that somehow God's, God has enmity toward us and that that is taken away. Uh, now, first of all, 1G. The fact that reconciliation never has God as an object is not final proof that God is not reconciled. Matthew 5.23, let me read that for you. The way it is used here makes it possible, I think, that God could be the object of reconciliation even though it is never expressly stated. Matthew 5.23 is the case where uh, Jesus is telling you if you, you're going to go and worship, take an offering, and you're, somebody has something against you, you know, deal with it. Let me read what he says. If therefore you are presenting your offering at the altar and they remember that your brother has something against you, leave your offering there before the altar and go your way. First be reconciled to your brother and then come and make your offering. Who is the object in this, the way it's stated verbally? Who is the object of reconciliation? The guy that's going to make an offering, right? But who has the animosity? The other guy, right? 
So if you're going to be reconciled, you are going, you are in a sense going to change him. Isn't that true? You've got to change him. So in a sense, this reconciliation involves not just the offerer, but it involves the person who holds something against him. And so Murray goes on to explain explain how this uh, certainly allows the possibility for when it says God has reconciled us, not to exclude the fact that it might involve some change in him as well. In other words, the death of Christ not only brings a change in us when we you know, accept it and repent, but it also removes the enmity that God had toward us as sinners. And let's go to 2G, see, God has enmity against sinful man. In Romans 5, it speaks of that. It's not clear here, well, it's fairly clear, I think, uh, who has the enmity, but let me read the verses. Much more than having been justified by his blood, we shall be saved from the wrath of God through him. For if while we were enemies, we were reconciled to God through the death of his son, while we were enemies, who, who has enemy, enmity, I should say, against whom here? You could say, obviously, we were enemies of God in our sin, right? But if you look at verse 9, we shall be saved from the wrath of God. It sounds like there could be a little enmity on God's side as well toward us in our sin. And so I think that uh, this is a case where it does seem to me that enemies, probably on God's side, enemies of God, maybe also on ours as well. In Romans 11, it seems to me to be quite clear <laughs> that it speaks of God having enmity. Uh, 28, from the standpoint of the gospel, they, that is Israel, they are enemies, unbelieving Israel. They are enemies for your sake. But from the standpoint of God's choice or election, they are beloved for the sake of the fathers. Now, the beloved is clearly God's love for them. So I would suspect that enemies means God's enmity toward them. From the standpoint of the gospel, they are enemies of God for your sake. From the standpoint of God's election, they are beloved. And then 1 Corinthians 15, 25 talks about God putting all of his enemies under his feet. And clearly, that shows that he does have enemies. And that he sees them as enemies. Okay. Uh, to me, then, the best conclusion is to say that reconciliation not only affects the change of man or change of God. It is the change of the relationship between the two through the removal of the barrier of sin in the death of Christ. In other words, I think it has an effect on both sides so that now they can be friends and they can have a relationship, a close relationship of love. Uh, last, the effect of reconciliation. What is the effect? What did you find? That was a question I think you had, right? What did you find? What is the effect of the reconciling work of Christ's atonement? Anybody? Okay, go ahead. It did what? It brought us near to God or? Or God near to us. Near, God near to us? Okay. What else? Yes. Yeah. Okay. Anybody find something else in there that it reconciliation affects? What did you do with uh, Ephesians two fourteen through eighteen? Did you see that simply as a reconciliation with God? See, here it talks about he himself is our peace who made both groups, that is Jews and Gentiles, into one and broke down the barrier of the dividing wall by abolishing in his flesh the enmity 
which is the law of commandments contained in ordinances, that himself he might make the two into one new man, thus establishing peace, now notice, and might reconcile them both in one body to God. I took a class here, and I think, I think this is true, that our reconciliation with God is also a reconciliation with our fellow man, with other believers. In other words, if we are reconciled with God, I think the Bible would say, we as believers in the new man being reconciled with God, every division between us, and in this case it's talking about the Jewish law and, and the, I think, ethnocentrism that it brought, all of that is erased by virtue of being reconciled in Christ. So he makes of Jew and Gentile one. And, and we were alienated before, as it indicates earlier in that same chapter. And then Colossians 1 talks actually about the restoration of all things. And I think the same word is reconcile. He is some sense going to ultimately bring everything back into its proper order uh, through the reconciliation of the cross. So uh, let me put it this way. Whatever alienation sin brought, whatever uh, disturbance of relationships that sin brought, the death of Christ uh, brings peace. And we should recognize that. Sometimes I think we don't always carry what Christ did for us in relationship to him into our relationships with our fellow believers. But in the New Testament, that should take place, I think. Any questions on reconciliation? Did you ever think about, how many of you have ever thought about yourself at one time as being an enemy of God? Yeah, we were enemies of God. It's hard for me being growing up in a Christian home, solid evangelical church, to think of myself that way. But I have to do that. Romans 3, there is none good. All of that stuff is true of every, every one of us. It takes, I think it takes a little. How many of you were raised in Christian homes that way? See? At what point did you come to think of yourself as an enemy of God? I mean, really? Yeah, I, do, I think it's a, uh, it's a bit of a problem. I know I talk to some men. I've got a little men's Bible study every other Monday, and all of them have been through Celebrate Recovery things. So they, they are, in just listening to their stories, they have quite the background uh, that, uh, well, let's put it this way, a lot of dysfunction and stuff in their lives, their families, everything like that. And so they, they could really, you know, see a difference. But for somebody that's just been, it's hard sometimes to realize that. And, and the more, you know, the, the more in life as I began to really think about these things, the more it became clear to me that I was just as much of a rebel. And it, it still is, it just, it's just different, you know. You just see that ego is there, and that's the thing that's in all of us. And it just shows itself in different ways, that's all. Okay, uh, let's go to redemption. Uh, the meaning in the Old Testament, there are several words, three basic Hebrew words. The first one, ga'al, which has to do with the kinsman redeemer type of thing. It has to do with family relationships, acting as a kinsman. You know some of those things from the Old Testament, responsibilities of marrying the widow of a deceased kinsman, buying one out of the uh, one of the family out of slavery, reclaiming a field that somebody in the family owned. 
Uh, and it was also used for buying back something that had been sanctified to the Lord, like you could redeem. The Levites were actually supposed to be offered to the Lord, but you could redeem them, and then they became the, the Levites. So Morris says in that book, which I think is very good on all of this, Thus, in the Old Testament use of the word, we find two distinct ideas. The primary thought is the, is the general one of family obligation, and arising out of this is the narrower concept of the payment of price redemption. So the payment of a price to redeem something. Uh, the Lord is the subject of it. He's the one that redeems and redemption of the nation of Israel from Egypt from Babylon and for individuals. And then the question really is, to whom is the payment made? And that always has become a little problem. Uh, who was it in early church history that believed that uh, the payment was made to the devil? I think Origen believed that, that he uh, somehow, and, and he puts it almost like uh, it was given to him like bait uh, to a fish because when he, when he bought it, it turned out to be his ruin. <laughs> but it was a payment to the devil to ransom him. And, and it, there's some logic to it in the sense of who holds us in bondage. See, ransom for us is basically to pay a price to free us from slavery. And we are slaves to sin. I don't know that it ever says we are slaves to the devil. It's usually slavery to sin. But the question is, I don't think we can answer that. I think what uh, Westcott here says that I put in our syllabus, the idea that it, it's costly for God. God did pay a price. Jesus paid the price. But God was in Christ reconciling the world. God was in Christ paying the price for redemption. And Westcott says, it cannot be said that God paid to the Egyptian oppressor any price for the redemption of his people. On the other hand, the idea of the exertion of a mighty force, the idea that redemption costs much, is everywhere present. The force may be represented by divine might or love or self-sacrifice, which become finally identical. To me, it's a little bit like, to whom do you pay when you pay a traffic fine? Who are you, who are you paying to be ransomed from whatever it would cost you if you didn't pay it? <laughs> well, I mean, are you paying it to the city treasury? The treasurer, I mean, to whom, what person, to whom are you really, are you paying it to the governor? Are you paying it to the treasurer of the city? Are you, are you paying it to the people? Or are you in a sense, some sense paying it to the law type of a thing? Now they always do in court, don't they? The, the people against so and so, that's the way they describe the case. How many of you have gotten anything from that, those payments? <laughs> if they're paying us, I would like to see it. But I suppose they say it reduces my taxes a little bit. I don't think we need to think about to whom the price is really paid. It, it's fundamentally paid to God's law demands that penalty. And uh, it's paid in that sense. I don't think we should ever think it's paid to Satan. Uh, or it's not really paid to sin. Uh, OK. This, the next word, pada, the base and beginning of this word is that of a ransom by the payment of a price. It's more of a commercial idea than an obligation arriving out of kinship. So this is a broader term. Skipping down a sentence, it is used for the redemption of the firstborn which belonged to the Lord, which should be sacrificed to him. 
but in certain cases could be redeemed by the offering of a substitute, indicating that the idea of substitution is basic in this word. And it's this word that's used with the Levites, redemption of the firstborn of Israel. Uh, the substitution of the Levites were given instead of taking all of the firstborn. The Lord is a redeemer in the sense of this word and the de deliverance of his people from Egypt, uh, as well as instances not specified in other places, and he redeemed from the power of the grave and from all iniquities and all troubles. Then the last word, kofer, which really means to cover over. It actually, one of the terms is uh, kofer is a ransom price, but it can be used also for propitiate. So it's the sum paid to redeem a four-footed life, uh, a forfeited life. For its use with God is the one who ransoms his people. Look at Isaiah 43. Morris puts these things together, I think, in a good way. He says, redemption consistently signifies deliverance by payment of a price. There may be other ideas like that of family obligation in the first word, Gael, or the element of grace in Pada. But as a stubborn substratum, in every case, there is the basic price-paying conception. There is never any thought of God paying the price to anyone. As Westcott says, and we gave you that quote earlier, the idea that redemption involves a cost is present. The term is used metaphorically with God, but as Morris says, the metaphor retains its point. The idea of price-paying is not out of mind. So. In redemption, God pays a ransom. When Jesus says that he came not to be served, but to serve and give his life a ransom, that's the word there, the last one. Uh, it's, it's a payment of a price to ransom us from something that held us, and we needed to be free. Now, in the New Testament, there are two Greek word groups. The first one, lutrao, which is the idea of fundamentally of paying of a price in the substitutionary sense for the freedom of someone in bondage. And that's where, look at the bottom one, well, not the same place on yours, but Matthew 20, 28, that's the one that I just quoted. Uh, the Son of Man did not come to uh, serve, but to give his life a ransom, a lutron, a price, he paid a price to free us. And then 1 Peter 1, there it talks about we were not redeemed with silver and gold, but with the uh, blood of Christ. And then a verse you will be memorizing, Ephesians 1, 7, later, uh, in whom is redemption through his blood, the forgiveness of our trespasses, I think it says. So that one is fundamentally freedom from bondage. The next one adds something to that, agarazo. Uh, the basic meaning of this word is to acquire or to buy. In relation to redemption, it emphasized divine ownership based upon divine purchase. So here, what this adds is God just doesn't free us from bondage to kind of let us just go. <laughs> You're free, go where you want to go. When he does it, he buys us to himself. He pays the price, frees us from bondage, but now we are bought and owned by him. That's the thought in this one. So when it talks about being redeemed here, uh, it's talking about being purchased and bought and coming under the ownership of God. So the conclusion, redemption, includes the ideas of the payment of a price in a substitutionary sense for the freedom of an object from its previous owner or the bondage under which it was held with the idea that the object redeemed now belongs to the redeemer. Any questions about the meaning of this? Okay, the next one is an interesting one that really relates to our life, I think. From what does God's redemption free us now? And what is the result of this freedom in each case? Okay, uh, what did you find here? From what are we freed now? Yes. 
Okay. What else? You. You have other things there, I know. <laughs> Feel free. Okay, the curse of the law. Is that what it says? It does say the curse of the law, right? Not just freedom from the law. Okay, how about Galatians 4 3? What was that? Freedom from what? What did, what did you take that to mean? <laughs> I'm just curious. You did take down your commentaries, right, and uh, see what that meant. I will just say that Morris takes that. Uh, to be elemental spirits. Some people take that to be the fundamental moral laws that people have, had, that, that kind of innate law. It's kind of analogous to Galatians 3 in terms of the written law, the Old Testament law. There are elemental principles. Uh, some people think it's the elemental principles of morality that all men know from which we are freed as a law type of a thing. Uh, I don't know, I take it here, I guess, elemental spirits, but I think the spirits use the law, moral law, to hold people in bondage. Well, what, spirit, yeah. Elemental spirits mean like, like demonic spirits? Yes. Why are they, why, what does that mean that they're elemental spirits? Well, it just means that they're, they're fundamental things that uh, are, are related to the fundamental uh, moral laws, and they use that. They tell people, you have to do this, and you get depressed because you can't do it. It's just, it would be like in the law, anybody that's under law, the devil uses that to keep people in bondage, doesn't he? Uh, to say that Christ has fulfilled the law for me, puts it in a whole different ball game, it seems to me, a different perspective. And the devil uses law to keep people in bondage, I think. And in this sense, I would say the elemental spirits are behind that. Yeah, I don't know how many of you heard Dr. Arnold in chapel today. Any of you hear it? That reminded me again that uh, we're not just doing moral things. And those men in my class that have had trouble with drugs and alcohol and uh, all kinds of things like that, I think they need to hear that message because they're not just dealing with habits, just simply habits. There's a spiritual power that's at work. And uh, we're always dealing with that. I don't think that there's anything, probably nothing against God that doesn't have some relationship to some spiritual power. Wouldn't you say that's true? It, it, you can think about these kind of things a lot, but I was just thinking about this, this work of Christ takes power to free us from bondage. Isn't that what all this is saying? You are in bondage. Well, bondage implies some kind of power, doesn't it? Isn't that true? I mean, if somebody's holding me in bondage, that means some force. What is that force? Is it, I mean, is there is a commandment in the Bible or anything like that, just words, is that force? What would you say to that? Have you ever thought about the fact that, that, that you're fighting against a force and what is this force? Does disobedience per se have power in it? I don't know. Unless there's a force of evil, clearly. And does a force strike you as something living? It's certainly something active, isn't it? 
we need to think about that. Is there, if there's a living force that is opposing God, and that that's what we're dealing with, according to Ephesians 6, we don't fight against flesh and blood, but we fight against these principalities and powers. See, we're talking about um, living beings that are probably involved in holding us uh, in power. Uh, that's what I like so much of what uh, Clint said about the fact that they, we need to realize they don't have that power. We let them have the power, but they don't have to. We don't have to do that anymore. Okay, uh, 1 Corinthians 7. Uh, how many of you have ever felt like you were enslaved to man? You, you did what you did to please some human, right? So you felt like you were kind of a servant to them. Anybody ever done anything like that to please somebody? I suspect we all have. So we're freed from that. We don't have to please other people. I mean, it's nice to do it sometime, but we're not a slave to them, I guess it's say. Uh, well, as men as opposed to God. See, we should never please humans as opposed to God. And then finally, <clears throat> free from the, the uh, fear of death, from death and its fear. And clearly, uh, in the redemption of Christ, the resurrection, it took some power to overcome death. So there's a force in sin that we need to think about. And I, well, I guess I would say I'm not going to necessarily say it is simply the living power of the, the uh, principalities and powers in Satan, but I don't think that it uh, doesn't exclude them. Now our time is up. Well, let me just say this. I'll make this comment and then I want to leave you with a question. All of these things, the Bible says you and I are free from them now. We don't have to sin. Before we came to Christ, we were slaves of sin, which tells me we didn't really have any other choice. Even in our good works, they were motivated by self-glory. They were not motivated by the glory of God, so they were sinful. But once we come to Christ, we are free from that. Uh, we don't have to listen to sin anymore. We do because sometimes we still have a certain propensity to some of those things still in us, certain appetites, but we don't have to, to give in. Where before, I think we didn't really have a choice. We may have had a choice which way we, which bad thing we did, but we don't have that anymore. So I would just encourage you to think about that. I'm free from, from sin, the bondage of sin. I'm free from the bondage of law. I'm free from the bondage of man-pleasing. I'm free from all these things in Christ. That's tremendous to think about. And uh, when temptation comes, I would think flee to Christ and his work. Okay, the question I want to ask is when was this victory wrought? When did Christ actually overcome evil? Was it, who's the, uh, man? Campolo, Tony Campolo had that famous sermon, it's Friday but Sunday's coming, have you heard that? That was a, that was a sermon that, well he, he mentioned a black preacher that preached that, it's Friday but Sunday's coming. Now the, the, the tenor of the sermon was basically, you may be going through bad times, dark times, but Sunday's coming. That seems to me to say the victory was resurrection. So I will leave you with the question, was the victory at the cross or at the resurrection? And think about that. We'll talk about that next time. Biola University offers a variety of biblically-centered degree programs, ranging from business to ministry to the arts and sciences. Visit biola.edu to find out how Biola could make a difference in your life.